So today we will be discussing parental pocket elimination. It is a very theoretical topic, which is often very confusing for a lot of clinicians. Now, periodontics as a specialty deals majorly with diagnosis and management of periodontitis and its maintenance. We will be briefly discussing periodontal pocket elimination procedures only and how to go about a case when a patient presents to you and to decide whether or not it is a candidate for periodontal pocket surgery in the first place or not. So let's begin. So today we will be discussing this presentation under the following headings and starting with the uh, presentation. So uh, periodontal surgery must be, considered as, must be considered as an adjunctive to cause-related therapy and therefore the various surgical methods described in literature should be evaluated on the basis of their potential to facilitate removal of subgingival deposits and self-performed infection control with the ultimate goal being to enhance the long-term maintenance of periodontal health. So uh, European Federation of Periodontology uh, recently came up with the level guidelines for the treatment of periodontitis stages one to three in the year 2020. They recommend that patients once they have been diagnosed should be treated accordingly to a pre-established stepwise approach to therapy that depending on the disease stage, it should be incremental and each including different interventions. Now it has various steps. And the first and second steps of periodontal therapy are commonly referred to as cause-related therapy and include in the first step, all the needed behavioral changes and motivation that is required to undertake a successful removal of supragingival dental biofilm by the patient, all measures headed towards risk factor control, which can be cessation of smoking, uh, glycemic control, stress reduction, etc. The second step includes all the professional interventions aimed at reducing and eliminating the subgingival biofilm and calculus with or without the use of adjunctive therapies, which could be antimicrobials or anti-inflammatory drugs or various other forms of post-modulation agents, mouthwashes, etc. So the first and second steps of therapy should be used for all patients with periodontitis, irrespective of their disease stage, only in teeth with loss of periodontal support and or periodontal pocket formation. So the response to these two steps should be assessed once the periodontal tissues have healed. That is, periodontal reevaluation has been done, which usually completes between 6 to 12 weeks after the completion of the second step of periodontal therapy. Only when the endpoints of therapy, that is, that there are no bleeding points, no periodontal pockets greater than 4 millimeters, and presence of bleeding points, or no periodontal pockets which are greater than six millimeters have not been achieved, then the third step of therapy should be considered. Now, who's a patient who has stable periodontitis? When the treatment is successful in achieving stable periodontitis defined by gingival health on a reduced periodontium, that is bleeding on probing in 10% of the sites, then the patient is diagnosed as a patient with stable periodontitis. Therefore, adequate measures for inflammation control should be implemented to prevent recurrent periodontitis since periodontitis patients will always remain at an increased risk of a recurrence in the presence of gingival inflammation. Now, third step of therapy. What is the third step of therapy? It is aimed at treating those areas of the dentition which do not respond adequately to the first or second step. That means despite doing the first and second step, there is presence of pockets greater than four millimeter and bleeding and probing on more than 10% of the sites or deep periodontal pockets greater than six millimeter. The purpose of this step of therapy is to gain further access to subgenderval instrumentation because there are times when scaling and root planing is not enough, so we need access for uh, deeper sites. Or in those lesions that add complexity in the management of periodontitis, for example, presence of infra bony pockets or percussion lesions to either regenerate them or resect them. Now, regenerative and resective surgery are two different surgical techniques, which are different topics altogether. Now, the third step of therapy may include the following interventions, either repeated surgical instrumentation with or without adjunctive therapies, access flap surgery, resective flap surgery, or regenerative periodontal surgery. Now, before we begin how to manage a periodontal pocket, we should know what a pocket is. So let's go back to basics. The periodontal pocket is classified, is defined as a pathologically deepened sulcus and be classified into the following categories. It can either be a gingival pocket, also known as a pseudo pocket, or a periodontal pocket, which is also known as a true pocket. 
Now, gingival pocket is formed by gingival enlargement without destruction of the underlying periodontal tissues. The sulcus is deepened because of the increased bulk of the gingiva. Now, whereas a periodontal pocket produces destruction of the supporting periodontal tissues, leading to the loosening and exfoliation of the teeth if not treated in time. Now, based on the location of the base of the pocket in relation to the underlying bone, periodontal pockets can be classified into the following types as well, supraboni and intraboni. Now, supraboni is also called as supracrestal or supraalveolar in certain literature. It occurs when the base of the pocket is coronal to the underlying alveolar bone. Intrabony pockets, also known as intrabony, subcrestal or intraalveolar pockets, occurs when the base of the pocket is apical to the level of the edges and alveolar bone. Now, with this second type, the lateral pocket wall lies between the tooth surface and the alveolar bone. It is further divided into three types depending upon the presence of the number of alveolar walls. It can be one wall, two wall, or three wall. Now, this is a diagram which shows the different types of pockets. A is gingival pocket, B is supraboni pocket. Note that the base of the pocket is coronal to the level of the underlying bone, which is the alveolar bone, and C is intraboni pocket. That means the base of the pocket is apical to the level of the adjacent bone, and vertical bone loss is seen, which can either be our one wall, two wall, or three wall. An extraction socket is also known as a zero wall cavity. Moving on to classification of pockets according to involved tooth surfaces. Now, A is a simple pocket, involves only one surface. B is a compound pocket, involves more than one surface. And C is a complex pocket, originates on one surface and twists around the tooth to involve one or more additional uh, surfaces commonly found in the next, or um, commonly found in focation areas. Now, once we've established what a periodontal pocket is, we should know how to measure it. And the tool for measurement of a periodontal pocket is a classical periodontal pope. Now, most clinicians use an explorer, which has a sharp pointy end towards it and insert it into the sulcus. Now, it doesn't measure anything but causes more harm than good. So we should always use a periodontal probe, which is uh, blunt towards the tip and has graduations and markings present on the probe. As is seen in this picture, this picture shows that a UNC-15 probe is being inserted into the sulcus. And it shows that there is a pocket depth of nine millimeters. So the probe is inserted parallel to the vertical axis of the tooth and walled circumferentially around each tooth to detect the area of deepest penetration. The ideal way of inserting a probe into the sulcus and walking it around is the correct way of measuring a pocket. Moving on, we will move to the objectives of periodontal surgery. Now, these are objectives of all forms of periodontal surgery, not just the ones which include pocket elimination. So we perform periodontal surgery to gain access to the root surface because sometimes we are unable to do that with scaling group training or phase one therapy. Elimination of inflammation, because sometimes in the subgenital area, there's presence of calculus and plaque, which cert releases certain noxious agents, which give rise to inflammation. So once we have access to that and we are able to remove it, elimination will resolve in its own, on its own. Creation of an oral environment conducive to plaque control. Now for that, we can establish gingival sulcus for easy periodontal disease control, that is elimination of pocket. Correct abnormal gingiva and alveolar bone morphological characters that interfere with plaque control. Perform root sectioning procedures to improve the morphology for easier oral hygiene maintenance. Create an easy to clean uh, and proper embrasure space. Now that can be done with regeneration of periodontal apparatus destroyed by periodontal disease. Uh, resolution of gingiva alveolar mucosa problems is also one of the objectives of periodontal surgery. Aesthetic improvement remains an important one as well. And preparation of periodontal environment suitable to restorative and prosthodontic treatment, which is interdisciplinary periodontics, is also an objective of periodontal surgery. Moving on to the management of periodontal pocket. So periodontal pockets, once we've established that there's presence of a periodontal pocket and we know that it is either supraboni or intraboni, we will move to the treatment section. So if the pocket is supraboni, the treatment options are gingivectomy, apically positioned flap, and undisplaced flap for complete elimination of pocket. Mind you, there are other options available for reduction of the pocket, but we will not be discussing those today. And management of intraboni pocket is a different section altogether. Now, if there's presence of intraboni pocket, the first is 
the deciding what is the depth of the intrabonic pocket. Now, according to Carl Dahl, if the depth of the pocket is less than three, then we move to the elimination of the pocket. If it is more than three, we move to the regeneration of the pocket. So if it is less than three, we can either perform root resection, hemisection, strategic extraction, extrusion, or osseous resection. Osseous resection might have osteectomy or osteotomy. Now regeneration in which we can perform a uh, plap surgery with bone grafts or GTR, et cetera. Now, once the periodontal pocket is established, how do we go about it? Phase one therapy always remains standard. We perform supra and subgingival scaling and root planing, give the patient oral hygiene instructions, and then reevaluate the patient after a few weeks. The first, if we either want to proceed to work pocket elimination, then we go about gingerectomy, apically reposition flap. Uh, and other forms of treatment. Whereas if we want to correct the pocket or reduce the pocket, we perform surgeries like modified vitamin. And once these have been done, we move to supportive periodontal care, which is also the maintenance phase. Before we move on to the pocket elimination procedures, we should understand this concept called critical probing depth. Now, this concept was given by Linde et al. in the year 1982, and he gave us two values, one for scaling and root painting, which is 2.9, and one for modified vitamin flap, which was 4.2. That means then for scaling, for example, that means that below this probing depth, the site would lose clinical attachment as a result of therapy. However, above this value, clinical attachment gain will result. For modified Whitman, it means that open flap debridement is only beneficial above this value and below this value, attachment loss will result. Another critical probing depth was recently given by Hates Mayfield in the year 2002, and they gave the value of 5.4. This means that lab surgery is indicated predominantly with a probing depth of greater than 5.4, while between 2.9 and 5.4, non-surgical therapy will be beneficial. Now, all these critical probing depths are given in uh, 5.4, 2.9, and 0. Point something. So we should ensure that these we can't measure uh, these values with the help of a probe. These are uh, mean scores. That means they have a modest level of variation pre present, and that should be understood. Now, according to the latest classification, which is given in the year 2018, any pocket which is greater than three millimeters after performing phase one therapy is also suitable for uh, undergoing uh, surgical procedures. So after given all these values, and a clinician is often confused. So you have to uh, select each case and assess accordingly and then decide whether or not the patient is a suitable candidate for periodontal surgery or not. Then we have moving on to the first pocket elimination procedure, which is gingerectomy. Now, over the years, different surgical techniques have been introduced and used in periodontal therapy. Firstly, these procedures were called, uh, I mean, pocket lining was called disease gingiva, and they were aimed to remove at this uh, remove this disease gingiva. Then tissue elimination included not only uh, inflamed soft tissue, but also infected and necrotic bone that required exposure of the alveolar bone that is flap was raised in such cases. Other concepts such as importance of maintaining the mucogingival complex that is the width of the attached gingiva and gingivectomy procedures. Now this incision was initially given as a straight incision. The gingivectomy incision was initially straight but now Zentler has modified it and now it is a scalloped incision and the incision for gingivectomy is often known to be as the external bevel incision. So the first step of gingivectomy is marking of bleeding points. It can be done with the help of a pocket marker or a probe. And once the bleeding points have been marked, we move on to the next step, which is giving the incision. Now this can be given with the help of a periodontal knife, it can be Kirkland or Orban, or we can use a standard Bart Parker blade for this. The incision can either be continuous or discontinuous. Once the incision is given, the extra pocket lining is removed and the margins are evened out with the help of either a blade or a, a, a gingivectomy knife. Now, since we know that gingivectomy wounds heal by secondary intention, a periodontal pack is always given on top because we do not want the wound to be damaged uh, in the oral cavity while it is undergoing healing. Now, this is a picture that was taken after around seven to 10 days. And as you can see, the margins are very sharp. The gingival margins are sharp and deflecting. And it seems as if the patient has regained healthy contours again. Moving on to the next pocket elimination procedure, which is the apically repositioned flap. 
Now in the mid 50s, the focus of periodontal surgery shifted towards the aim of preserving an adequate zone of attached gingiva after surgery once the periodontal pockets had been eliminated. Now, one of the first authors to describe a technique that aimed at the preservation of gingiva was neighbors in 1950s with a surgical technique for repositioning of attached gingiva, which was later modified by Tyrell in the year 1957. Now, in 1962, Friedman described more precisely this technique and proposed the term apically reposition plaque. Because at the end of the surgical procedure, the entire complex, that is the gingiva and alveolar bone, uh, alveolar mucosa of the soft tissues, rather than the gingiva alone, was displaced and repositioned in an apical direction. Now, hence, instead of removing the excessive gingiva after osseous surgery, if at all of this performed or indicated, the whole mucogingival complex was maintained and repositioned apically. Now, this can be performed in uh, buccal surfaces of both upper and lower jaws on the lingual surfaces of the lower jaw, while a bevel flap technique has to be used on the palatal, uh, palatal aspect of maxillary teeth. Because on the palatal aspect of maxillary teeth, there is presence of alveolar mucosa, palatal mucosa is very firm and non-stretchable, so it is impossible to reposition it in an apical direction. Now, these images will help us to understand how an apically positioned flap is done. Now, following a vertical re in releasing incision, as you can see in the first picture, the reverse bevel incision is made through the gingiva and the periosteum to separate it from the inflamed tissue adjacent to the tooth from the flap. Now, once the mucoperiosteal flap is raised and the tissue collar remaining around the teeth is left, including the pocket epithelium and the inflamed connective tissue, it is removed with the help of a scalar or a curet. Now, osseous surgery is performed, as you can see in these two pictures, only if at all it is indicated. To, and if it is indicated, it is done to improve the physiological uh, contour of the alveolar bone. The flaps are repositioned in an apical direction to the level of the recontoured alveolar bone crest and retained in this position with the help of sutures. A periodontal dressing is placed over the surgical area to ensure that the flaps remain in the correct position during healing. Now, apically position, uh, reposition flaps comes with its own sets of merits and demerits and contraindications. The obvious most advantage of this procedure is that uh, periodontal pocket is eliminated and attached gingiva width is maintained. And it even increases in certain cases. Uh, gingival morphology is established and good oral hygiene can be maintained. It ensures healthy root surface necessary for the biologic width on the alveolar margin and lengthened, improved length of the clinical crown. Now, there are certain contraindications which are associated with this type of uh, flap surgery. Now, periodontal pockets in severe periodontal diseases. Now, patients who have excessive probing depths, excessive attachment loss, for example, six millimeters, it is completely contraindicated because it is not possible to apically displace that much uh, length of uh, the, uh, the gingiva more apically. Periodontal pockets in areas where aesthetics are crucial, obviously, when we apically reposition the flap, it, it will harm or hamper the aesthetics. So it is not advisable in the anterior area. Deep intra bony defects. In such cases, regenerative surgeries are preferred. Patients are at a high risk for caries. Now, since the roots are probably, roots might get exposed because of this surgery. So, patients who have high risk for caries because enamel is not present on the surface of the tooth, uh, surface of the root. So, these patients who have a high risk for caries are complete contraindication for such procedures. Similarly, patients with se severe hypersensitivity. Tooth with marked mobility and severe attachment loss, tooth with extremely unfavorable clinical crown to root ratio are also contraindicated. The disadvantages are that it can cause aesthetic problems in the anterior region, can cause attachment loss due to surgery, can cause hypersensitivity or increased root caries, unsuitable for treatment of deep pockets, and possibility of exposure of vacations and roots, which complicates the post-operative suppression level plaque control. Now on displaced flap. Now this is one of the most commonly performed type of periodontal surgery and one of the most efficient one as well. It differs from modified Whitman flap in that the soft tissue pocket wall is entirely removed with the initial incision. Thus, it may also be considered as an internal beveled gingivectomy. 
So the undisplaced gap and the gingivectomy are two techniques that surgically remove the pocket wall to perform this technique without creating a mucogingival defect. It should be determined pre-surgically that enough attached gingiva will remain after the removal of the pocket wall. The difference between undisplaced flap and modified Whitman flap is that in modified Whitman flap, we only remove a predetermined 0 0.5 to 1 millimeter of uh, pocket lining, where in undisplaced, we remove as much of it as present. Now, this is the picture that was uh, referred to us for undisplaced flap. The first step is marking the pocket with the help of a bleeding, uh, with a pocket marker and creation of bleeding points. Second, uh, and then the first incision is given, which is the internal bevel incision, followed by the trabecular incision, which is made from the base of the pocket to the crest of the alveolar bone. Flap is reflected with the periosteal elevator. Interdental incision is also given, which is used to detach the disease connective tissue. The area is debrided of granulation tissue, tissue tags and scaling and root training is done. The area is flushed and flaps are secured with sutures. As you can see in this picture, the incision is given. This is after the second incision. This is after debridement and the flap is raised. This is, as you can see, the pocket lining has been entirely removed, which varies in its thickness depending upon the presence of probing depth of that patient, of that specific patient. Here, interrupted sutures were given and periodontal pack was given. So before concluding, I would like to say that traditionally pocket elimination or closure has been the main objective of surgical periodontal therapy. The removal of the pocket by surgical means served two primary purposes. The first was the elimination of the pocket, which maintained an environment conducive for the progression of healing of periodontitis. And the second was the root surface was made accessible for professional debridement and for self-performed tooth cleaning after healing. Now, from these two objectives, uh, the necessity for pocket elimination has been challenged since it is not feasible to imagine a situation where the probing depth is zero or there is zero pocket dentition after periodontal therapy. It seems to be unrealistic. Therefore, long-term cohort studies evaluating the incidence of progression of periodontitis after successful periodontal therapy have been uh, have been have been going on for a while. So uh, Cases where the residual probing depth is greater than six millimeter, or there's a persistent bleeding on probing, where the periodontal probing depth is greater than four millimeter are significantly associated with disease progression. Therefore, the current endpoint of periodontal therapy is to achieve a dentition with no sites of deep pockets. Pockets might be there, but they should be maintainable. And this information has thus formed the basis of the role played by the periodontal surgery in the preservation of teeth. Because presence of residual disease after the second step of periodontal therapy requires further treatment as a part of the third step of periodontal therapy. However, increased pocket depth should not be the only indication for periodontal surgery since probable depth, that is additions from the gingival margin to the base of the sulcus, where the tissue resistance is felt after insertion of a probe, may not correspond to the true pocket mainly in the presence of gingival inflammation. Furthermore, there is no established correlation present between the probable pocket depth and the presence or absence of active disease. This means that signs other than increased probing depth should be present to justify surgical periodontal therapy. These include signs of inflammation, especially exudation and bleeding on probing, as well as aberrations of gingival morphology. Therefore, before moving on to a surgical periodontal procedure, the clinician would need to evaluate each and every patient that visits him and sites within the individual to determine what type of treatment will best preserve the dentition in a state of health with comfort, function, and aesthetics. And before signing off, the main conclusion, the main objective of periodontal surgery is to contribute to the long-term preservation of periodontium by facilitating plaque removal and infection control. And periodontal surgery can serve this purpose by creating accessibility for proper professional scaling and root planning, establishing a dentition without deep pockets and open pockets, establishing a gingival morphology, which facilitates self-performed infection control, in addition, periodontal surgery may aim to regenerate the lost, uh, lost periodontal apparatus, which has been lost because of destructive disease, or uh, to change the anatomy of vocation lesions to improve accessibility for infection control. So once a patient with periodontitis, if 
the patient walks into your clinic and you've established that the patient has pockets and you've established you've done your appropriate radiographs and you know that certain treatment is required, each site in a particular patient's mouth has to be carefully evaluated and a thorough treatment plan has to be devised accordingly. If you have any questions, please leave them in the chat box. And here is my email in case of any doubts in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was such an elaborative and thoughtfully constructed presentation. And we often see clinicians overlooking periodontal issues. And But I'm sure with the practitioners like you putting in their efforts to raise awareness, this will the condition will soon be better. So before uh, going to the Q&A round, uh, I want to give our attendees a gist of what we are at Dentist Shannon Online via a short presentation, if you may allow. Yes. Mom, can you stop sharing your screen? Yeah, I'm just trying. One second. Right. Thank you. Dentition on our largest digital dental media of its kind. We offer multiple services for a wide range of audience from updating you with dental news to dental webinars, courses and events to consultation services and content writing. It's a milestone in itself to have conducted over 700 live webinars with 40,000 participants and 25 workshops with 400 beyond speakers from all around the globe. We have had another feather in our cap. We have been certified by India Book of World Records for maximum speaker participation in any virtual dental program on oral implantology. We would love you to join us as our prime members and avail multiple other benefits, one of which is a certificate of participation for each of our webinars and our courses. And each of the certificate contains one CPD point. You can become our prime members at a mere sum of 799 per annum, which will further be discounted by using my promo code AN100. For the future webinars, we have Dr. Hilary Moori joining us on 12th of August and Dr. Ruhan Singh joining us on 13th of August, respectively. We would love your engagement at multiple social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, WhatsApp, and Telegram. So we would also love your engagement at our website, www.dentistchannel.online. Thank you so much. We may begin with a question and answer round, ma'am. Maybe? Yes, please. Right. So the first question is, is periodontal surgery recommended in patients with pseudo pockets? Uh, patients who have pseudo pockets definitely have an enlarged gingiva. That means they do not have a true pocket. That means the base of the pocket is not present apical to the level of CJ, but they do have a place for black accumulation and further bacterial invasion. So yes, Patient, although the pseudo pocket itself stands for false pockets, but such patients should also be treated first by phase one therapy. If they do not resolve, then we should move on to gingivectomy procedures. Right. And there's another question, which is the most conservative approach to pocket elimination. See, uh, the most conservative approach to pocket, uh, pocket therapy would be non-surgical periodontal therapy, which is a good round of scaling and root planing. And by scaling, I do not mean sub supra gingival scaling. I mean sub gingival root planing. Uh, in most cases that are referred uh, to a department of perio, uh, most cases resolve a lot of pocket reduction and cal gain is seen in patients after just a round of scaling and root planing. So according to me, I think the best... Uh, the best solution and the most conservative one would be scaling and root planing. There was one more question that how can we reduce pseudo pockets? It is a similar type of a question. I mean, compared to your first one, pseudo pocket treatment is uh, possible uh, with the help of uh, scaling and root planing. And if they resolve, then it is fine. After that, we have to perform uh, gingivectomy to reduce them. 
Right. Um, I had the one question myself. Like, how tricky is it to convince patients to get periodontal surgery? Since parental uh, problems are painless, most of the people don't even realize that they have this problem because it is a very slow moving progressive illness, but it is very common. So in such patients, proper motivation and education is necessary. And it is that's why it is uh, advisable to all specialists and all general practitioners. That if you see signs of initial forms of uh, periodontal disease, you must refer the patient because most of the times when patients come to us, it is too late and we cannot do anything about it. So treatment should begin only in the initial stages so that the uh, disease progress uh, halts itself. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. That was one lovely stretch with you. And we had an amazing time interacting with you. And I'm sure our participants uh, would have loved your presentation as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. So here we mark the end of our webinar and see you soon, Dr. Gumbal. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.